and they have scripture that, to help back that up, which they actually use uh, some of the radical patriotism scripture and, and uh, vice versa. So we'll look at those. Number one, God ordained government. Look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, if you would. Genesis 9, verse 6. Genesis 9, verse 6. Now, uh, just to set this, after the flood, the major flood, and this was a worldwide flood, right? It wasn't an area flood. The Bible tells us it was a worldwide flood. Now, that's a big flood. Yep, it sure was, but it was worldwide. So after this worldwide flood, there were only, only, only eight people left on earth. And the only animals that were left were on the ark. Now, there were still fish in the sea. But after the flood, God ordained government. He began to put into effect order and the responsibility of a governing body. See here, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. God started to really define from here on what this order is and how in the a governing body is to exercise authority over someone else. Look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1, if you would. Romans 13, 1. It says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing bodies or authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. So even Paul recognized, the Apostle Paul recognized that the authorities in place have been established by God. Now this is, this, you, you can, we can get on a rabbit trail on this, and we can talk about the governing body here in America, in the White House, in the Senate, in the House, in the, well, yeah, th those three branches of the government there. We could talk about that. We could say, there's no way uh, um, that some of these guys should be in there. God, God establishes the governments. Number two, God expects obedience to human government. Remember, we're, we're still on here. Radical patriotism, talking about the Christians who fall into the radical patriotism part. Titus, check out this. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. I keep skipping it. So, Titus chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Remind them to subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. You know, the people are to be subject to and submit to the government as an act of obedience to God. Wow. To obey God is to obey our government. Right, Imelda? <laughs> She's giving me a, a look. Hold on, we're, 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 just, we're establishing this right here. Radical patriotism. This is what we're establishing. Number three, obedience is never, or it, excuse me, obedience is necessary even to evil governments. Radical patriotism. Romans chapter 13, verse 4, if you want to jump back there. Romans 13, 4. For it is a minister of God, that is the government, to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Here Paul says that the Governing authorities are servants or ministers of God. So during the time of Paul, now think about this, but let's put this into perspective within the environment and culture of Paul. Who was the, act, who was the emperor at this time in Paul's life? Any idea? Who? Nero. Yeah, absolutely. This is the guy who... Let me, let me just give you a quick, let me give you a quick briefing. I, I, want, you, I want to tell you how crazy, I, I've 
I got this thing about studying the emperors, and I, I have in the past a lot, especially first century emperors, but listen to this. Claudius was, was an emperor. We see him in Acts. He's the one that expelled Christians and Jews out because they were fighting all the time, and he used the word uh, Christus, which is, uh, we, uh, in Greek it would be Christos, but I, it sounds like, you know, just a, maybe a misspelling there, but they used him, or they, they kicked them out because of the battle uh, uh, with Jesus. Well, Claudius ended up marrying a lady by the name of Agrippina. Worst mistake of this man's life. Agrippina had a son named Britan um, Nero, which is not his actual full name, but this a part of the name, Nero. Well, Claudius had a son by the name of Britannicus. Now, Britannicus was a bit older than Nero. This is what ended up happening from what we can put together of history is that Claudius ended up dying by being poisoned by Agrippina. But Britannicus was a bit older than, and that was his wife, Britannicus was a bit older than Nero, so he was going to assume uh, the position of Caesar, of emperor. So Agrippina was able to convince her son Nero to kill Britannicus. And it, it, is, it is said that when they took Britannicus's body in an open casket and walked it down Rome, that they, they ended up putting these, like this white soap powder on him. When the wind blew, it blew it off and his body was purple because Nero used so much poison to kill him. Oh, that's what I've read about it. Well, Nero, or Agrippina, ended up going to the Senate, convincing the Senate that Nero should be in power. Nero goes into power. He ends up later on killing his mom, Agrippina. This is, a, this is a crazy family. Nero is also the one who killed Christians and put them on stakes and, and pour, poured tar, tar on them and lit them up to light up the streets and then light up his, his acreage, his yard. This guy was not here. I mean, he was out in left field, way out in left field. But, I mean, how do you grow up with a lady like that and not be in left field, you know? So th this, is, this is the guy. This is Nero. He was a wicked man. He was terribly brutal. Matter of fact, he, he even died. He actually killed himself later on. Okay. Uh, so it's just a nice little circle there. And he was such a wild man that he ended up actually burning Rome down. And he blamed it on the Christians. So during the time of the apostle Peter, in, you know, and, and others who were other Christians who are in Rome, Nero sends his soldiers out and goes door to door looking for Christians to put them in jail in order to get the attention off of him for burning down Rome because everybody knows he did it, but he blamed the Christians and caused a big uproar. This is the kind of man that we're talking about here. And the Apostle Paul writes at the time of Nero, to obey the government. <laughs> wow. Take a look, if you would, Old Testament for a moment. Daniel chapter 4, verse 32. I think, Paul, you must have been talking about another time, right? <laughs> he wasn't. Daniel 4, verse 32. And, and he's instructing all the Christians in Rome to do that. They're the ones that are living, I mean, right there in the midst. It is written that Caesar, or the Emperor Nero, would leave his house at night with a team of soldiers, and he would dress up and rob the stores in Rome and protect himself with the soldiers. Isn't that something? Look at Daniel 4.32. It says this, And you... You will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat, like cattle, and uh, seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is a ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on, or disp dis um, bestows it on whomever He wishes. God puts it into power, 
He puts individuals into power whomever he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar, the reason Nebuchadnezzar was in power, now, when, remember Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk, prophet Habakkuk uh, said to God, he said, God, what, when are you going to deal with the people of Israel? They're horrible people. They're, they're uh, defying you. And God said, hey, I'm sending the Chaldeans, which is a, a the Babylonians basically and they're going to come wipe you out and Habakkuk said wait that's not what I meant that's not what I want you to do God said it's going to happen anyhow and then he ends up God sends the Babylonians and that was actually Nebuchadnezzar's dad okay who was actually king Nebuchadnezzar was general during that battle there were three exoduses three of them starting at 605 BC that brought Jews out of Israel and took them to Babylon Later on, okay, soon, during, I think it's between the second and third exodus, Nebuchadnezzar goes back home because his dad passes away. He becomes king. He ends up bringing the rest of them, and here he is king. And God establishes, God established him in that power. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Isn't that something, though? If this doesn't make you think, I'm telling you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 says this. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Now, submit yourself for the Lord's sake. Not for our sake, not for anybody else's sake. For the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. This worldview uses those scripture verses to say that civil disobedience is never right. And do they have a good argument? They got a good argument, right? So let's look at this next one. Biblical submissionism, civil disobedience is sometimes right. I mean, after those verses, is it really sometimes right? Now, there are two positions held on when it is right for Christians to disobey God. Two Two, of, uh, two positions here within biblical submissionism. The first is when the government makes a law, uh, right here, promulgation, when the government makes a law that is contrary to the word of God. Okay? And number two, it's called compulsion. It, compulsion, right, not the anti part, but the compulsion, uh, is the government makes a law that is contrary to where God, so the second one's called a compulsion position. It's when a government commands the Christian to do evil. All right, so let's look at these. Anti-promulgation prop, uh, position, which is disobedience of government when it makes unbiblical laws. Okay, so now we're going to this anti-promulgation, the anti-law, the anti-decree, when the government makes unbiblical laws. This particular view is held by, believe it or not, Thomas Jefferson one of our forefathers. He said this, people have a right to disobey government when it contradicts the moral law or an individual's conscience. Now, the problem with him saying that is because Thomas Jefferson was a deist. You know, he, his, his view of Christianity was quite different than what the Bible says. But he did hold to a lot of principles of Scripture. And one of the problems with what he's saying here, and I think we all get the concept of what he's saying, and we probably all would agree to some degree of what he's saying. But when he says, when it contradicts the moral law, okay, so it, you only have a, a stable, absolute moral law if you have a transcendent God who creates that moral law and you obey it. And then he says, or an individual's conscience. This conscience is bound to the sin of this world. Now, there's a lot of good in the sense that God has placed in us his law, so we know the difference between right and wrong. But we can disobey that. And the more we disobey that, the more the conscience becomes weak. So just because my conscience says, you know, for example, I don't want to wear my seatbelt. My conscience says this. If I get into an accident, I'd rather be thrown out of the car. I have a better chance of living thrown out of the car than to be strapped in the car in case it catches on fire. So my conscience says don't do it. So from this perspective, just go and do it. So it's, it's a little skewed what Thomas Jefferson is saying, but I think we understand what he's saying 
in part is, is from his perspective, is that he, he's speaking from a more righteous standpoint. When our conscience is right, when our, when our moral law is right, and the government purposefully goes against that. I think that's where he's going with that, so we don't want to beat up him. He had the right perspective. Our forefather had the right perspective. Now, a great Christian man by the name of Francis Schaeffer. Anybody heard of Francis Schaeffer? I mean, you're talking about a great theologian right here. He wrote a book back in 1980 called The Christian Manifesto. Anybody read The Christian Manifesto? Okay, yeah. So in this book, he gives the, the description of the anti-promulgation position. So we'll use some of what he said to understand this position. What, so what we're trying to do right now is establish under the biblical submission uh, category here of civil disobedience, we're trying to establish the anti-promulgation position. Whether we agree with it or not, let's just establish it. Number one is this. The power of government is not absolute. That's where he goes first. And this is what he says here. The late Francis Schaeffer said this in the Christian Manifesto. Kings then have an absolute power in their regiment to do what pleases them, but their power is limited to God's word. In other words, the law is king. The king is not the law. Government should be under God's law. Okay. Number two, governments which rule contrary to God's law are tyrannical. This is, this is I mean, this gets really hardcore. This gets very interesting here. Shaver said this, the law is founded on the law of God. Hence, tyranny was defined as ruling without the sanctions of God. In other words, whenever a government rules contrary to God's word, it has ruled tyrannically. Whew. I mean, that's, that's interesting. Number three, resistance takes two forms, protest and force. Citizens should first protest the laws contrary to God's word. If this fails, then force is necessary. And Schaefer defined it this way. He said, force means compulsion or constraint exerted upon a person or persons or on a entity such as a state. What do you think about that? <laughs> Anti-promulgation. That's the position of that. Jennifer? Well, so when, when the British... Um, who are being taxed and being ruled by the, the government. And by the way, uh, the Anglican church is still run by the queen, right? She's the head of the church. And when they left, they came to the United States to form a, a culture that has a government that doesn't usurp or regulate the church. So that's where the, you know, the, the tax thing comes from. Now, for an ordained pastor or a licensed minister in, I think it was the 1950s, or before the 1950s, the ordained ministers were taxed. And someone mentioned, someone stepped up and said, hey, the church is not to be, or the, the ordained minister is not to be ruled in the sense, or by the government. So the taxes should be limited to show that there is some form of distance between the government and the licensed minister. So in the 1950s, they came up with what was called housing allowance. So the pastor is still taxed. Matter of fact, I am considered self-employed, right? So you know what self-employed means, double Social Security, <laughs> right, double Medicare. But they don't tax me on certain things, but they do tax you on other things. They were able to kind of work their way around. Now, that was challenged several times. Matter of fact, it was just challenged, I think it was the beginning of last year, last year or the end of two years ago. You know, a federal, so an atheist group, uh, they're called, um, um, come on, Mike. They're called, uh, I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, I can't remember what they're called. It'll come to me later when I'm in bed tonight. So, 
they Yeah. Yeah. So now it, it all goes on to the the licensed. Yeah. And then that's kind of the way that they get their money. Okay, but it's limited. So that was challenged by an atheistic group who said that e even the housing allowance isn't right because there should be e equality here. And a federal judge said it's unconstitutional, but put a stay on it until it went full before a three-panel um, judge or judges and an appeal court, and the appeal court upheld the current constitution because our constitution does say there has to be some form of that separation where the government isn't ruling over us because that's why we came, that's why the British came to America was to, to make that not happen. So yeah, that's kind of the, and what happens if they do start taxing? What, what does a church do? That's what kind of what we're talking about here. So did I help you? Did I answer anything or did I just talk? It's not supposed to. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. They don't, but they are exercising that in um, California. The government is exercising authority over the church right now. He's illegal. Yep. As long as the courts uphold that. And with our, with our current Supreme Court right now, they have been upholding um, you know, th there was a ba battle, I think it was, where was it, Colorado, Nevada, or somewhere? Yep, where uh, casinos are opened at 50% capacity, but the churches are supposed to be at 25%. They're shutting them down, so it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the casino, and um, that's actually against the law. So what do you do in a situation like that? Uh, at some point, you got to tell the government that we're, we're moving forward. You know, yeah, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, it comes a point where, you, you know, you, we want to, we want to act in such a way, because the, the, the church in the past has always acted in a way for the sake of humanity. If there's a humanity problem, the church has always stepped up, and, and we, you know, the church has always said, we're going to do what's best for humanity, but when there comes a point when the models are no longer relevant, that the church has to assemble. Why does the church have to assemble? Because God commanded us to assemble. We have to be together. So we, we will be. You know. Now, so that's anti-promulgation. Now let's go to anti-compulsion. Because this is the second aspect of biblical submission. And we're all on the same page, right? We know what's going on. Is this kind of, is it interesting to you? you it's, it's pretty neat, right? Because we, we, we need to know this because this is what, de what we're dealing with today. Well, in this thinking, Christians have a right to disobey the law when that law forces them to do evil. So a little different than anti-promulgation, which says they're decreeing a law that, is, that opposes God's law. It's different than God's law. Anti-compulsion is when they're forcing you to do evil. Now, the Christians who held this view see Scripture uh, instances of divinely appointed civil disobedience. Let me, let me explain that. Number one, for example... In Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 21, if you recall, we talked about this several weeks ago where Pharaoh told the midwives to kill the babies, right? And the midwives said, well, silently, we're not going to do that, <laughs> right? And God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even numerous, according to chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Number two, refusal of Pharaoh's command not to worship. Now, in Exodus 5, Moses told Pharaoh to let God's people go because that was God's command to Moses. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. They're to leave Egypt now. And Pharaoh replied, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. God made a command and Israel, or Pharaoh, anti-compulsion, made a forcible law that said, you are going to stay here. You're not going anywhere. Number three, refusal to stop proclaiming the gospel. The authorities 
commanded the apostles in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 19, or chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 19, they commanded the apostles to not speak the name of Jesus. Remember that? You've read it before. And what did Peter, how did Peter reply? Remember, they were whipped for it. And then they said, okay, you can leave now, Peter, but you will never tell another soul about this Jesus. Paraphrasing that. And he responded, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. But we're doing it anyhow. So the apostles went back out, and immediately they proclaimed the gospel. They proclaimed Jesus' name. There's obviously more examples with throughout Scripture, but just this kind of gives us the, the framework of what anti-compulsion is. So, biblical submissionism, it's okay to disobey the government when the, government, when the government contradicts Scripture, setting up laws that contradict Scripture, and when the government tries to force upon you something that is against Scripture. Yes? Absolutely. So, like, like, what do you mean? Like, what do we do? Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and it is really, in a sense, contradicting God's law because God says that the church is to assemble. So if the government says you are not going to assemble, that is greater than the First Amendment. And that's why John MacArthur wrote his letter. He said, we're not even appealing to the First Amendment. We're appealing to the law of God, of Christ. So it's a good question. What do we do then? Well, biblical submissionism is the answer. Because the government is telling us they're making, they're contradicting themselves, which shows that they, he, he doesn't understand the law, right? But even if we didn't have that law, well, yeah, that, that could go right along with it. But the a- anti-compulsion right here tells us that he is forcibly creating a law that is in opposition to God's law. So under the biblical submissionism, disobedience is right. And that's why when John MacArthur wrote it out, he specifically used the term civil disobedience because he was referring to the church has to civilly disobey when man's law contradicts or tries to usurp God's law. Yes? Well, and a person is considered disobedient if they take a different action before the church is prepared to mm-hmm. take that action. So yeah. That's what you should tell them. Yeah, well, I mean, so what, what, we, what they need to do in a situation like this is this is where you get the ACLJ involved and Christian Law Association and, and those types of guys you need to get them involved to fight for the the rights. However, the right of a Christian supersedes the law. So, so even if you're in Iran, and Iran doesn't allow you to assemble together as Christians, you should still assemble together. If you're in China, you should still assemble together. Now, do you want to do that? For, for the world to see, or do you want to do that in your room? It's kind of up to you. It, you know, it depends. But no matter what law is created, God's law usurps all law. So in that case, in, you, you have to make the decision. Is anarchyism, is that the way the Christians should behave? We want to sometimes, but, it, but is it the way? Radical patriotism from a Christian perspective should we never, ever, ever uh, have, um, exert civil disobedience? Or is biblical submiss- submissionism, is that right? God establishes governments. We've, we've established that fact, right? Scripture says God establishes government. God wants us to obey the law. 
Now let me tell you, man's heart is wicked. And when man's heart tries to supersede God and become king over God, man will then create laws contrary to God's law. So we always obey the law. All right, I'm just going to tell you. Look, my understanding of Scripture, always obey the law unless that law supersedes God's law because even though God establishes governments, man is still evil. And if that individual, those individuals submit to the evil in their heart and usurp, try to usurp God's law, then there comes a point civil disobedience needs to be enacted, right? I mean, that's just, a, that's just the reality of it. Now, like I say, you know, some of the things that are going on in our country right now with wearing masks and things like that, you have to ask the question, does that supersede God's law? If it doesn't, then we just obey and if we want to fight against it, we fight it on a legal plane. But if a time comes, and it has come in California, I think it's come in other states, where the governor tells you forcibly, anti-compulsion, you're, you will not obey God's law. That's what he's saying. You will not assemble. You will obey me. And that's the time that the church has to say, I don't think so. Yes. With, yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I get that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, this is where the ethical system comes in, right? Because we want to be, you know, we've got a few minutes left here. 